So our framers of the American Constitution were obsessed with the idea of independence, by which I don't mean the idea that gave birth to the revolution of 1776. I mean independence that was at their center of their attention in 1785. Because in 1785, all the great founders of our nation recognized that America was a failure. In 1785, extraordinary corruption defined American government. And the focus on independence was a focus on the lack of independence that representatives throughout the state governments had in their role as representatives. They instead displayed a dependence in the way in which they lived their life as representatives. They were dependents upon interests who didn't have the public interest in view. As Eric Foner writes, it was an axiom of 18th century political thought that dependents lacked a will of their own and thus did not deserve a role in public affairs. And as Thomas Jefferson put it, dependence begets subservience, venality, suffocates the germ of virtue and prepares fit tools for the designs of ambition. So they looked for a non-dependent representative, an independent representative, one who could provide right answers for the right reason. And the common aim of their enterprise was to build institutions, to build constitutions against that dependence. For in 1785, they recognized that they had to do this if democracy was to survive. Now, what's interesting about this idea of independence, this idea of dependence, is that despite the fact that we've forgotten the original meaning of this idea of independence, this concept of dependence is actually one which still rings true for us today. It's an extraordinarily rich idea. It's real to us in all sorts of parts of our lives. Think about the dependence of an addict or the dependence of a rich kid or the dependence of a rock. In all of these contexts, we recognize someone overwhelmed by often a destructive force, but they can't help but yield to this destructive force. Two, the idea is actually very complicated. The contours of dependence are complicating. The meaning of what is dependence actually depends upon the entity. So think about dependence for citizens. They could be dependent upon the government, unable to decide about what public policy ought to be. And that's actually what animated for some of our founders, the idea that there should be property requirements for anybody who would be given the power to vote so that they would not be dependent upon the government. They could instead give their view about what good public policy was independent of that policy. And then dependence for representatives is different again. The representative was not to be dependent upon private interest. So here is Daniel Webster, a member of Congress in the early part of the 19th century. At the time he was a member of Congress, he was also in the employ of the Bank of the United States, the bank whose policies he as a member of Congress actually affected. In a letter he wrote to the Bank of the United States, if it be wished that th my relation to the bank be continued, it may be well to send me the usual retainers. This was an improper dependence, what we would call bribery, though bribery was never illegal in the United States until 1853. <laughs> Second, there's another kind of impropriety here. What's impro improper for one might actually be proper for another. So think about this statement. The doctor prescribed the drugs that maximized her kickback. 
plainly inappropriate, but compare it to Walmart built where it would make the company the most money, plainly appropriate. Right? So the point is, money is fine for some, but not fine for others. And recognizing that distinction is a way to understand that criticism of dependence is not a criticism of money, it's a criticism of money in the wrong place. Or third, sometimes there's a dependence directly and sometimes there's a dependence indirectly. So direct dependence is what we typically think of as corruption, the sort of thing that Daniel Webster was guilty of. And when we think of this idea of corruption, we think of it in a very harsh way. So for example, Laura uh, under uh, Kuffler describes corruption in this sense. Corruption is a status. A person, when corrupt, has changed. Evil has captured her being, her essence, her soul. That's accor that accords with our sense of this corruption. But we need to recognize that corruption is also indirect. Dennis Thompson talks about the institutional corruption that infects many institutions within our society, but the one he talks about is Congress. This too is a kind of corruption, and not just a corruption for Congress. So think, for example, about the pharmaceutical industry. 2005, the pharmaceutical industry was a $200 billion industry. $15.7 billion from that industry was spent on promoting drugs. We should keep that in context. This year will be the first presidential election to spend $1 billion picking a president. They spend almost $16 billion promoting their drugs every year. Now, of that $16 billion, about $5 billion is spent on something called detailing. Detailing. The process by which drugs are marketed directly to doctors. So between 1995 and 2000, the number of detailers exploded from about 38,000 to 100,000. That means there's about two and a half doctors for every one detailer in America. Now what the detailer does is give samples and gifts to the doctors as a way to affect the prescribing choices that the doctors will make as one detailer described it. The essence of pharmaceutical gifting is bribes that aren't considered bribes. Now this is actually small potatoes in my view. There it is, small potatoes. <coughs> the real problem I want to focus on is this problem of research, research in basic science as it's affected by this industry. So a local San Franciscan, Dr. Uh, Drummond Rennie, describes in this extraordinary paper when evidence isn't what he discovered when he was the head of one of America's leading uh, medical journals, as he puts it, quote, massive bias and distortion of public e published evidence by researchers and their sponsors, both influenced by money. As he summarized it, it was found that companies were paying physician scientists to publish the same results of the same trials in different journals under different authors' names with no cross-referencing or they were getting the results their sponsors wanted in drug trials by hobbling the other horse in the race, the competitor's drug, which in the trials was administered in the wrong dose by the wrong route, or offering tens of thousands of dollars simply to add their own names to reviews of drugs effic efficacy, reviews they had never seen before, and which were always favorable to the new drug. Now, as Rennie says, what's the result of these practices? Well, the result is plainly false science because they can actually study, compare the difference in the results between trials that are sponsored by the industry and trials that are not. And as he concludes, in every one of the many scores of such studies of published trials, an overwhelming bias was found in favor of the sponsor's drug a bias that was not present when the trials were performed by investigators free of commercial funding. Now the point I want you to see is this too is corruption. It's a corruption of science and it's a corruption that comes from a kind of dependence, a dependence of those who participate on money, yet just because of this indirect influence, 
we don't think of these participants as evil. Indeed, we think these are good people living within an evil system, a corruption but just indirect. So morally, we might say it's not as bad as the kind of corruption that infects your soul. But the thing to recognize is that it could actually be much more harmful to the society. This indirect corruption, much more damaging than the direct corruption of bribery. Now, my career over the past 10 years has been thinking about a certain kind of dependency over these last 10 years, struggling to get policymakers to focus on a particular issue. Now, if any of you have spent time trying to get congressmen or congresswomen to think about a particular issue, trying to get them to focus, you might have this analogy in your head to this fantastic character on the wire bubbles. Um, a brilliant character. He, in fact, is quite well read. The person who he represent was a person who spent an extraordinary amount of time reading the greatest literature, but he was a person who it was very hard to get him to focus on anything, constantly driving his attention elsewhere. That was Bubbles. That is our Congress. <laughs> the issue I was trying to get them to focus on was the issue of copyright, a question. What copyright policy makes sense in a digital age? For copyright law was written for a radically different time, for a radically different technology. And the point wasn't that we need no copyright. I think copyright is essential in a digital age, just as in an analog age. Instead, we need a copyright law that's appropriate to the technology. So for example, think about the problem of digital archives. Google, a company you've heard of, launched a project they originally called the Google Print Project, later renamed to the Google Book Search Project. The objective of the Google Book Search Project is to Googleize books. Now, what would that mean? Well, they went around to a bunch of major American libraries and they identified about 18 million books that they wanted to scan and facilitate a search on in just the way that we search the billions of pages on the internet. Now, these 18 million books fall into three categories. One category, about 9% of those books, are books that are in print and presumptively still in copyright. 16% of those books are books that are in the public domain, meaning 75% of these books are books that are presumptively in copyright, but which are out of print. So the Google Book Search project would then scan all of these 18 million books and then grant access differentially depending upon which of these three categories the books happen to fall within. So the books that are in the public domain, they would grant full access to those books. You could see and read the whole book, in fact, download it in a free PDF. But books that were presumptively under copyright, Google would at least give you snippet access. Here's what that looks like, literally, snippets from the page. <laughs> that would connect to the words that you searched upon. So you could identify the book and a little bit of the reading around that book for the particular interest you had, but you couldn't read the whole book. And in fact, if you tried to promote multiple searches to that, uh, for that particular book, it would block you after a certain number of searches. And then for books that were in copyright and still in print, meaning books that you could actually connect to a copyright owner about, they would give you as much access as the publisher or authors allowed. So here's an example where you could search and you could read a couple pages around the particular search term that you found. Now this project was an extraordinarily ambitious undertaking, but it might not surprise you that not everybody loves Google. Not everybody loves the Google Book Search Project. And in America today, the way you say that you don't love somebody is that you sue them. So. <laughs> The Authors Guild and the American Association of Publishers did file a lawsuit against Google in 2005, and they took the position that before Google could scan these 18 million books, they needed permission from the copyright owners for all of these books that were not in the public domain just to facilitate the scan. So that means the 16% of books in the public domain would still be accessible, and the 9% of books that are in print and still in 
copyright would be accessible because we know who to ask for those. But the point to recognize is that if this is the law, 75% of our culture is just invisible in this space because there's no one to ask. There's no place that is a list of copyright owners. There's no simple way to discover who requires the authority to just have access to this work. It makes it invisible, if that is the rule. Now, does anybody actually think that this rule makes sense in a digital age? I think the answer is anybody who thinks practically about the effect of these rules realizes it doesn't. But despite this recognition, there's been an extraordinary struggle in this context and in many others, and a struggle not just by me, importantly, not most importantly by me, by many organizations that have tried to get policymakers to recognize why the law is just out of date, yet they still don't get it. Or even, they don't even see that there's another side to the issue. They have a simple frame provided to them by Hollywood that resolves every question about copyright. And so instead, they consistently get these questions wrong all the time. Not in the hard cases, because I understand why government gets hard cases wrong, but in the easiest cases. So for example, the one that I fought most vigorously, the question of copyright term, it is a consensus among policymakers that if you're going to extend the term of copyright, it could only make sense to make that extension applicable prospectively only. So a study conducted in, in Britain by the Gowers Commission concluded after reviewing all of the economic evidence that it, quote, never could make sense to extend the term of an existing copyright. Makes sense from the perspective of the purpose of copyright, which is to create incentives. Because the one thing we know about incentives is that they are perspective only. No matter what we do, George Gershwin will not produce anything more. <laughs> this issue was so clear that when we took the case to the Supreme Court and wanted a bunch of economists to provide a brief, Milton Friedman, that right-wing Nobel prize-winning economist said he'd join the brief, but only if the word no-brainer was in the brief <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Yet despite this clear consensus among policymakers, always governments extend the term of existing copyrights as well as future copyrights. So the most recent cycle began when Germany extended its term, leading the EU to extend its term, leading the United States to extend its term, leading the EU to extend the term to match the United States, leading Spain now to talk about extending the term yet beyond the term of the EU. The point is, here's an easy public policy question which governments consistently get wrong. And not just in the context of copyright, obviously. Think about another issue that I've recently been studying a bit, nutrition. There's a consensus among people who study nutrition that we eat too much of this stuff and not enough of this stuff. So in 2003, the World Health Organization thought it would try to do something to help. It tried to promulgate a, a standard that said that only 10% of your caloric intake should come from sugar. Well, the sugar board, represented by this very sweet little signal logo here, <laughs> went ballistic, there they are, ballistic, <laughs> at this suggestion by the WHO, and they launched a campaign to get the WHO to change their recommendation. Indeed, they threatened to withdraw funding by the United States if the WHO didn't change its position. So here's a letter from the United States Senate, signed by Larry Craig, demanding <laughs> that the WHO back down from their consensus position of 10% and instead adopt a position that 25% of your caloric intake could come from sugar. Well, in 2003, the Food Nutrition Board authorized the recommended daily intake in the United States is now 25%. That's a balanced diet, according to your government. Here's what you can eat and feel, still feel healthy. You can start your morning with some Fruit Loops or M&Ms, <laughs> a glass of milk. Then for lunch, you can have a cheeseburger. And dinner, you can have a pizza, actually three slices of pepperoni pizza and some sugar cookies. That's a balanced diet. 
according to our government. So here again, this is an easy public policy question which our government gets wrong. And maybe the most profound here is in the question of global warming, a question which of course has become a focus of the attention of all right-thinking people recently, but there's been a long-standing consensus among scientists that as Al Gore puts it, we're doing it. He says there's a five-point consensus here. The debate's over. There are five points in the consensus. Number one, global warming is real. Number two, we human beings are mainly responsible. Number three, consequences are very bad. Number four, we need to fix it quickly. And number five, it's not too late. Now, there was a study conducted of peer-reviewed journals, 1,000 peer-reviewed journals, of articles published between 1993 and 2003 to evaluate what the consensus actually was among scientists who know something about this. And they found that of these articles in these journals, 0%, exactly zero, questioned the basic consensus. And then they did a comparable study of 600 articles in popular media between 1988 and 2002. And they found that 53% of those articles questioned the basic consensus. And the reason for this, of course, was the explosion of junk science that had been funded by the oil industry to delay the government's actual addressing of this question, junk science that led us for perhaps 10 years to delay addressing this question as industries supported the uncertainty which gave the politicians cover, as they said, there was nothing here to worry about. Once again, an easy public policy question that we've just gotten wrong. Now in all three of these cases, these easy cases which we get wrong, we get wrong in predictable ways. The result is bent, you could say queered, because of the influence of money. Mickey Mouse had a lobbyist, the public domain does not. Food Nutrition Board is surrounded by very sweet people who guide it towards a particular answer. Global warming is surrounded by not so sweet but just as powerful oil companies. As Representative Fingerhut put it, people conscientiously or subconsciously, sorry, tailor their views to where they know the sources of campaign funding can be and that has a consequence. As Representative Byrne described it, as he entered Congress, he was told, lean to the green, by which it was not suggested he be an environmentalist. <laughs> it was suggested that he focus on where the money comes from. Now, what this means is, and this is the point I want you to recognize connecting us back to our framers, this is a kind of dependency. Not on the right answer, not on the best public policy, not even on what the constituents in your district want. It's a dependency upon money, not functioning directly. No doubt, though, there is this dependency and it has a real effect on fundamental public policy questions. Now, there are people who say, in this Fox News-like way, some say that it's not a problem, that the lobbyists are, in fact, good that they're essential to this process and that they don't change the results. They instead support the results that particular public policymakers otherwise would be pushing. Indeed, and perhaps I think one of the very best articles in public policy uh, in political science in the past 10 years by Hall and Yerdorf. They study the way lobbyists actually deploy their resources. And what they find is that we should think of lobbying not so much as changing people's votes, but as a certain subsidy to the legislator, extending and, so and supporting and amplifying policy choices that the member had already made. And if you think about it like this, then you could say, well, this is just an innocent or benign or even beneficial part of the process. But what this argument misses is actually two different ways in which this misses the point. The first is that certainly what this process does is help represent certain views, 
But the question is whether in the aggregate it misrepresents the views of the nation as a whole, whether it's a distortion. So for example, if you go to Congress and you announce to the world, here are my issues. One, I want to deal with mothers and welfare. Two, I want to try to stop piracy. What you'll find on the very first day you open your door after being sworn in is that there's lots of people interested in helping you with the piracy problem and nobody who's interested in helping you with the uh, mothers and welfare problem. What that means is that it distorts the work that you're actually going to work on. So you're not working on anything you don't otherwise believe in, but you are working on things differently from how you otherwise would if the system weren't in this way distorted, not just by how lobbyists help you, but how you focus as you decide, how am I going to get reelected to this office again? Now, this reinforces the sense that the people in the process are not evil. They're not doing anything other than what they otherwise would want to do. They're indeed very good people, but they're good people in a system that can't help but distort the outcome. As former Senator Bill Bradley put it, these are fine public servants stuck in a bad system. But the second point that this benign characterization of the process of le legislative funding misses is the obliviousness to the question of how we create or how we practice or how the public reads something called trust. Think again about the issues that Professor Rennie is thinking about. So for example, there's a drug called Altaplace. It deals with what we used to call strokes, but now the industry calls it brain attacks. Okay, so. 1998, the American Health Association ran a study of this drug, and the study concluded substantial support for the health, the safety, and the efficacy of this drug, but there was a dissent. But in the 2000 report, reporting this result of this study, the dissent was erased. Indeed, the person who filed the dissent was removed from the list of doctors actually participating in the study. And then it was discovered that the company that made the drug, Genentech, had given the AHA $11 million in support, leading to obvious questions about whether the money had something to do with the result. As an LA Times reporter put it, this recommendation may have been made in the true spirit of unbiased scientific inquiry, but the appearance of dispassionate analysis was eroded by large do donations from a drug company. Or another example, think about vaccines. And here I need to be really, really careful so you don't think I'm a nut, so let me just say, vaccines are good and right and needed, no doubt about that, and mercury does not cause autism. Okay, just to make this very clear, vaccines are good. <laughs> mercury does not cause autism, right? This is not what I'm saying. But I want you to put yourself in the position, and maybe some of you have been put in this position, of parents thinking about this question of autism, either because their own children suffer from this debilitating disease, or they worry about their children suffering from this disease. Think about the years of anxiety that these parents have suffered because this relationship between the cause and the and link to particular practices has been so uncertain and rendered uncertain because of a pervasive lack of trust in the institutions that report on this scientific conclusion, leading to an extraordinary drop-off in the number of parents now vaccinating their kids. Before 1991, there was less than 1% of parents who refused vaccinations for their kids. 2004, that number's at over 2.5%. And if you know about how uh, disease spreads, even a small number of people not vaccinating will have a radical effect in the spread of very debilitating diseases. Now, why do parents have this lack of trust? Well, as the House Oversight Committee put it, it's because the FDA standards defining conflicts of interest are ridiculously broad. The CDC has virtually no standards because the committee members automatically receive annual waivers of conflicts, meaning they can receive money from the drug companies whose drugs they are evaluating without any question being raised about the objectivity of their judgment. In one case, more than $250,000 received by one of the members voting on the efficacy and safety of the drug. 
Or here's one final example. There's a fantastic film, if you haven't seen it, you should, called Maxed Out, telling the really terrifying story about the spread of credit card debt in our society. And one reason the spread of credit card debt is such a big problem is the enactment of something called the Bankruptcy Abuse Prevention and Consumer Protection Act of 2005. Actually, the Consumer Protection Act is just a typo. That's no Consumer <laughs> Protection <laughs> Act at all. Now, the effect of this bill was to make it effectively impossible for people who are lower middle class uh, income earners to discharge credit card debt. So while Bethlehem Steel can escape from pension obligations through bankruptcy, and Enron can escape to, from power obligations to supply California through bankruptcy, basically through bankruptcy, there's no escape anymore from credit card obligations. Now, this radical change was first proposed during Bill Clinton's administration. And Bill Clinton was originally in favor of this proposal. But after reading an op-ed in the New York Times, First Lady Hillary Clinton deemed this an awful bill. And as one commentator put it, she single-handedly kept it from becoming law, to her great credit. I didn't actually mean that, but I, it's kind of cute. Her great <laughs> credit. Okay. <laughs> but this bill, like Jason in Friday the 13th, just wouldn't go away. <coughs> So in 2001, after Bill Clinton was no longer in office, it returned. But by now, First Lady Clinton was Senator Clinton. And by now, she had received over $140,000 in campaign contributions from credit card companies and from financial services industry. So what did she do now with this awful bill? Well, in 2001, she twice voted for that awful bill, right? Twice in favor of it. It failed in 2001. Four years later, the bill returned again. Now, she again took the original position. She criticized it, but she actually was not on the floor of the Senate when it was voted on because her husband was having an operation. Now, what is it that explains this flip-flop in positions? Right? Hillary Clinton said it's not the money as she explained in a um, very significant uh, event that happened at the yearly Coast Conference. I think based on my 35 years of fighting for what I believe in, anybody seriously believes I'm going to be influenced by a lobbyist or a particular interest group. Now, now I actually 100% believe her. I don't think she's the sort of person who would be influenced by money coming into her campaign. But the point that is central here, that most people in this debate are oblivious to, is whether or not you believe in this particular candidate, what do other people believe about the system in general when this is how decisions are made? When I toyed very briefly with the idea of running for Congress in my own district when my congressman passed away, we ran a poll and discovered that 88% of people in my district believe that money in exactly that context changes the outcome of congressmen's votes. Or as Representative Valentin put it, people give money to campaigns because they're good people. They're not going to throw money down the drain. They see it as an investment. And the question people ask is, if it's an investment, what is the return? Now, even if it's not the case that it affects the result, even if for sure you believe the money doesn't affect the result, the one thing we need to recognize is that in all three of the cases I identified, these two cases from the medical industry and one from politics, once you mention money in the story, listening stops, thinking stops. Trust stops. People on the other side assume they know why the decision was made. Understanding here ends because money entered into the story is all we need to know to know why a particular decision was made, even if the decision was made for a totally different reason. We have no patience to listen anymore once money has been explained. And this I suggest, is the issue of trust. It's an issue of recognizing how trust is built. And recognizing, you know, it's not actually rocket science, this fantastic publication, Lonely Planet, 
begins every book with the following. Lonely Planet books provide independent advice. Lonely Planet do not accept advertising and guidebooks, nor do we accept payment in exchange for listings or endorsing any place or business. Lonely Planet writers do not accept discounts or payments in exchange for positive coverage of Lonely Planet, and I wasn't paid by Lonely Planet to tell you this today. The point is, it's an obvious point about how you build trust. So even if we believe that money has no effect, it has a fundamental effect on our ability to trust this institution. And we need to recognize that that will not change until the role of money here changes. And this is where I want to come back to the first point. When we think about the way our institutions function now, Congress and many others, we need to recognize this is 1785. Democracy in this nation has been profoundly compromised by the way we allow this system to function. This institution has an approval rating now of 19%. 19%. The vast majority of American people believe it is essentially corrupt. And the result is not revolution. The result is a profound apathy which creates precisely the climate that breeds exactly the kind of dependency that our framers were fighting to eliminate. Now, what can we do about this? Well, let's focus first on the what. What should change? And the first, simplest, and most obvious thing that could change would be public financing of public elections. And indeed, there is growing support in Congress for exactly this, modeled on two states that have actually adopted this process for state elections, Maine and Arizona. These states follow a two-step process where candidates qualify to become candidates by getting a significant number of people to give them $5 each. And then they are funded for the election. Now, there's no effort to silence people outside of the candidates who want to speak. So if third parties want to run their 527s, that's perfectly fine. And there's a dynamic built into the process. So if a lot of money appears on one side, it can be adjusted for on the other. But this is a process of guaranteeing that the attention of members running for office is focused on what the constituents in a district think rather than how they raise money for their election. Now, this idea has obviously had lots of support from the left. But there should be more support for this from the right. Because there's an important dynamic between funding of elections and how government works. The best example of that that I have recently come across was a story told to me by a person who used, used to work for Al Gore in the beginning of the administration when Al Gore was vice president. Gore had an idea about how to regulate the structure of telecommunications that affected the internet. So t uh, the Communications Act, as it right now is constituted, has six titles. Title II of the Communications Act regulates what we think of as common carriers or telephones, telecom. Title VI regulates cable. Al Gore's idea was that we would take telecom and cable as it relates to the internet and put it under something called Title VII, so DSL and cable would be regulated by Title VII, but Title VII would be essentially a deregulated title. So there would be basic, minimal regulations about interconnect, but no more. They took this idea to the floor of the, to the, to the uh, Congress, and the response they got back was, hell no. <laughs> How are we going to raise money from the telecoms if we deregulate them? And the obvious lesson here is if you want to know why is government so big, people on the right, it's because congressmen must get elected. There's this indirect influence driving to big government because you need to keep your hands in the mix if you want to have some power when you call up somebody you're regulating to say, I need money to get reelected. And this will remain so long as these elections are privately financed. What would the cost of this system be? 
Well, the estimates from the cost of the Durban bill, uh, which is the one I just described to you, would be about $2 billion per election cycle. So for two years, $2 billion. That's a tiny number, look, very tiny, um, <laughs> in the scheme of the overall spending of our government. One program, not actually the Durban bill estimates, it would be just $6 per person in the election process, or to keep it in a little bit of context, it's just five days from this war to fund public elections for the whole nation. Now, if we did this, it would have an obvious effect. It would add trust to some degree back into the system, it would remove this kind of querying that comes from the attention people pay to funders rather than constituents. It would solve in this one vote a critical part of the cause of the lack of trust that we have in the system. A second area, too, has been an increasing focus of people's attention, the question of earmarks. There's this perception and a reality about the way in which earmarks skew the process of political decision. Between 1994 and 2006, there was an explosion of earmarks that falls down a little bit after 2006, but it's suggested now it's going to climb back up. I'm focused on earmarks not because of the cost. I'm a liberal, I love government spending, so I'm not against spending money by the government. I'm focusing on it because of its relationship to this corruption or corroding of decisions that otherwise get decided for good reasons at least sometimes. Now, of course, lots of these decisions um, are not made for good reasons, and lots of the reasons that people have for assigning earmarks have nothing to do with good decisions. So, for example, this guy, Doug Hoschek, read that the government was looking for a fire retardant T-shirt so that the troops in Iraq would have a shirt that they could wear that wouldn't melt when conditions got extraordinarily hot. So he prepared a bid to provide this fire retardant t-shirt to the government. And then just before the bid was taken, he discovered that it was redesignated as a no-bid contract because of an earmark from this congressman from Oregon, an earmark which assigned the contract by law to this company who made a t-shirt which turned out not actually to be fire retardant. It actually melted on the skin of soldiers in Iraq. They had produced this earmark indirectly through about a $9,000 contribution to this congressman's campaign. Now, in my view, these changes at least have got to happen if we're going to build trust back into the system, the elimination of this process by which decisions get perverted in allocating resources and the elimination of private financing to these elections. So how do we do that? How do we bring this about? Well, the reality is we have a very brief period of time when something you can think of not as grassroots really but net roots has an opportunity to affect some substantial change. Net roots by which I mean non-Washington centered but DC focused. I mean, people on the outside of Washington thinking about how to change things on the inside of Washington. And that's what's led some of us um, to launch something that we call the Change Congress Movement, or at least the beta version of the Change Congress Movement. Change Congress is dedicated to be a bipartisan movement, net roots movement, designed to leverage and amplify the reform work that is being done by others. So think about it as a kind of Google mashup for politics. It functions in a number of stages. The first stage, which we launched a couple weeks ago, takes its inspiration from the other CC project in my life, the Creative Commons project. So Creative Commons provided copyright owners with a simple way for them, for copyright owners or authors, to mark their content with the freedoms they intended it to carry, so you went to a page and you picked which freedoms you wanted people to have with respect to your copyrighted work. You were given a license. If you click on that license, it goes to a simple commons deed that explains the freedoms and linked to that as a license that makes enforceable the freedoms associated with that content. Change Congress, in an analogous way, wants to provide a simple way for both candidates and citizens to signal the reform that they believe in. 
Here we have basically four planks that they can pick from. They can say that they're going to take no money from lobbyists or PACs. They can say they support a ban on earmarks. They can say they support public financing of public elections. And they can say they support changes to make Congress much more transparent in the way they function. A candidate does this by going to a page, a little bit like the Creative Commons page, picking the level of pledge that you make, getting a badge, which then gives you some code that you can put on your page. If you click on that, you then get to a candidate's page, which specifies precisely what the level of pledge uh, is that you might have. Citizen has an equivalent site where they can go and they can specify the pledge that they're going to make and then click from that on their web page and you can see what kind of level of reform that citizen supports. That's stage one. Stage two is, in my view, critical next stage, which gets released in full form next week. This is a set of wikified tools that enable an army of collaborators to work on the project, first of sussing out which candidates and members are actually for reform. So it's a project where you can go and track politicians about these issues. You start by finding out which is your district by giving your zip code. You then get candidates in that district. You can then click on one of the candidates and then start filling out through this form what that candidate says about this particular issue. And once that is filled out, then a second layer of volunteers verifies that candidate. So Jim Cooper is our first member from Tennessee to take the pledges of the Change Congress movement. This is the output from the process of this wikified project of uh, mapping, really, where actual support and pledged support is. Now the idea is after the wiki workers have produced this information, we can then take members and make a map of members of the United States Congress that captures a picture of where the support for reform in this broad sense is. And so we're going to take that map and for candidate members who make a pledge, we'll either have a red, dark red or dark blue map, uh, color for their district meaning either uh, Republican or Democrat, or if they've been discovered to, be the, to support levels of reform, even if they haven't taken the pledge, then there'll be a light red or light blue color. And if they've neither taken a pledge or supported reform, there'll be a kind of sludge color that's a function of how much money they take from lobbyists and PACs. <laughs> so we'll get a map something like this, right? And what this will do is to reveal something that is very hard to see right now. It will reveal just how deep and strong the actual commitment to change is and reveal that it comes from both the, the, the blues and the reds that change is a deeply purple concept in the scheme of the United States political system right now. And then the third layer of this will basically be to fund reform, the kind of carrot in the process mo mo uh, modeled on Emily's list. What we'll do is facilitate reform and funding of reform by allowing people to pledge based on where candidates are according to this pledge. So you can say, I'll give $5 every month for five months to candidates who match my pledge. And then that will fund and support these campaigns for reform. Now, all three of these stages are designed to build a recognition out there in a kind of Silicon Valley way or a Wikipedia way by taking this project and making it manageable, digestible, and segmentable so people can work on it 20 minutes a day in their pajamas or 20 minutes a week in their pajamas and feel like they are contributing to something important, just like Wikipedia was built. People have an idea of free knowledge. That's what animates their desire to help but they can do it in segmented, easily divided projects that give them a reason to believe there's a reason to work on it. And this project is designed simply to complement the work that's already being done by reformers in a wide range of public reform contexts. So the point is not that there are new ideas here. It's instead that there's a new opportunity that's been enabled by the architecture of this technology, which for a brief period of time, Congress or the incumbents don't yet understand. That's the promise of the Change Congress movement. We've taken these first steps, but the next steps in this, again, beginning next week, is to recruit 
the thousands of these web workers or wiki, wiki workers and especially geeks, but of course all of them citizens in this project, basically you in this project, to participate in the construction of this movement to both identify and then push people to align themselves with this reform. Because only this kind of change right now can be made by this kind of energy. Let me just end with one more thought. So 155 years ago, Thomas Jefferson, in writing about the state of Virginia, betrayed a very depressed vision of what he thought the future was going to look like. He wrote, we should look forward to a time, and that's not a distant one, when corruption in this, as in the country from which we derive our origin, will have seized the heads of government and be spread by them through the body of the people, when they will purchase the voices of the people and make them pay the price. And so have we come to that time now. Ronald Reagan echoed a similar idea when he tried to quote, I think it's a fabricated quote, he didn't fabricate it, but many people have, of a guy named Alexander uh, Teitler, which goes something like this, a democracy cannot exist as a permanent form of government. It can only exist until the voters discover that they can vote themselves largesse out of the public treasury. From that moment on, the majority always vote for the candidate promising the most benefits from the treasury, with the result that democracy always collapses over loose fiscal policy, collapses. Now the part that Reagan didn't quite get here is that the trouble we're facing here is not a product of the masses getting together and stealing money from the treasury. In fact, exactly the opposite. It's because uh, crony capitalists have found a way to get together and steal this money from the treasury. It's that people can use the power they have to capture the government, not the masses, but the few. This is not a problem of wealth pumped down in the system. Indeed, it's exactly the opposite. It's wealth pumped up. It is corruption in exactly the sense our framers thought about. It is dependence in exactly the sense in which they tried to fight. It is profoundly destructive of trust for government and profoundly destructive of democracy. Now, in my view, this is the most difficult political problem we face right now, to change this. And if you talk about this with experts, they will tell you that it is impossible to run campaigns designed to change this. They will say that there's no focus in ordinary people, no concern about things like process. Instead, people are only concerned with substance. Now, my view is even if that is right, even if the experts are right, even if there's certain failure to pursuing this kind of change, that is no excuse for us not to try to do it. Because we are the most wealthy and secure and articulate people in this polity. And if it's not us who try to do this, exactly who will it be? Because the most outrageous part of this story is that the corruptions that I'm described, describing are primed by the most privileged, and they are permitted by the passivity of the most privileged, namely us. But it's not my view that the experts are right. I think the experts are wrong. I believe, indeed, we can do this, because the experts forget these important moments in American history, the Watergate reforms, the progressives, 1787, which were process revolutions, revolutions focused primarily on changes in process that actually moved the nation to become something fundamentally different. And I also think the experts fail to see something which all of us know intimately. We all know intimately this kind of problem, what we could call this problem of 
dependency. Everyone in this room has known or has been harmed by an alcoholic. I know I have in my own family severely. And when you think about the problem of an alcoholic and recognize he might be losing his family, his job, and his liver, each of these the most important problems in some sense that he faces in his life, you recognize that until he solves this alcoholism, he will not solve those problems. The point is not that this is the most important problem. The problem of dependency, the problem of corruption, is just the first problem that we have to solve. There are no end to problems that we as a nation, as a nation face, extraordinarily significant problems of global warming, Iraq, economy, infrastructure, educating, broadband growth, even copyright, very important problems. But we won't address these problems sensibly until we solve this first problem. That is the change that we need, a change in this Congress. I'm grateful you would let me come here and describe this to you and to ask you to join us in this change. Thank you very much. Thank you.